down at the second, but they would know that judgment is coming. They would see the approaching signs. But on the other hand, I mean, he wasn't going to, you know, write it in the sky, okay? So those who were ignoring the prophecy, as in Noah's day, were just going on with life normally and not paying attention to what they were supposed to be heeding. So they, the unbelievers, were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. Who got raptured? The bad guys got raptured. Noah went in the ark, and the flood came and took them all away. And he says, that's what it's going to be like when the coming of the Son of Man is. Two will be in the field. One will be taken in judgment, and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, and the other left. Okay? The taking there is not shooting up into the sky. It's a taking in judgment. Okay. Uh, let's look at Luke. Luke chapter 23. Boy, there's a lot of stuff we could do here, but we won't. We'll just, I'm going to make a point. Okay. Um. Uh, Luke 23, verse 27. A great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For in the, indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts which never nursed. People don't usually say that, but someday people will say, Blessed are you if you were never cursed with having children and watching what terrible things happen to those children. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. Jesus says, You and your children. Okay? And when this terrible judgment falls, then... They will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. Now, let's look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 through 17. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Matthew, uh, Revelation 6, 15-17, coincides exactly with Luke 23. Jesus said, this is going to happen to this generation. This generation, you and your children. And that's what happened. Revelation 6 is talking about the same event when people of that generation would begin to say to the rocks and the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. The apostles spent all their time, well, not all their time, most of their time, a lot of their time, warning about this coming apostasy. Now, let me give you a little uh, assignment here, okay? Just remember this. Have you ever wondered, this used to cause me problems when I was a young Christian, I would read the Bible and kind of be embarrassed about one section of it. Because, you know, when you catch, if you catch a friend doing something that isn't exactly honest, it's embarrassing. And I knew the Bible was the Word of God, and it was written by godly men, and I felt like I caught one of them doing something wrong. Because I read Jude. And I read Jude right after I read Second Peter. And somebody copied somebody. I read Jude, and I realized he was basically saying the same thing that Peter says in Second Peter 2 and 3. It's word for word in a lot of places. Why would God do that in the first place? 
Why would God have Peter say something? And then Jude writes, I mean, it's not as if this is just part of Jude's. It's his whole book. He only wrote a little book. I mean, it's just a page long. It's 25 or so verses. And it's all plagiarism. <laughs> this guy cheated on finals, you know? <laughs> Writes his whole book and he just copied it from somebody else and said, oh, this is Jude writing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what if they got Peter's book first? And I began to wonder, gosh, why would he do that? And then I discovered there's a real important difference. And there's only one major difference. And you've got to kind of feel sorry for Jude. Jude starts out, and he had such high hopes. God had called him to be a writer, and he knew it. <laughs> and he, he had plans. He was going to give the church a systematic theology. I mean, he was beginning to end. He was going to deliver to the church the book. Okay, the, the book that he was researching. Oh, okay, planning ahead. What am I going to do? And so he's getting all of his materials together. And he's going to write this great systematic theology. And then something happened. And he couldn't write it. He had to write something else first. And what we got is the book of Jude. And I don't know if he ever wrote anything else. And we got just this little message of Jude. What happened was this. Peter, writing Second Peter, said, Watch out. There is going to be an apostasy in the church. And you're going to see masses of people fall away and false teachers come in. And it's going to get bad, folks. And there's going to be all kinds of trouble and wrath and judgment is going to be poured out. It's going to be a mess. And so Peter wrote this prophecy to the church. Well, the church has all got the prophecy. Passed around the book and everything, made copies of it. Everybody had this prophecy. And things are rolling along a little bit. Meanwhile, Jude is preparing his systematic theology. And he wants to write this great treatise on salvation. And then he saw that the things that Peter had said were going to happen were starting to happen. And people weren't paying attention to it. So, oh, no! Okay, I'm going to put my book aside for a little bit and I'm going to write a quick message to everybody. And what he does is he takes down exactly what Peter said with only one difference. Peter said this is going to happen and Jude, instead of using future tense, uses present tense and says it's happening now. And that's all Jude got to write. Now that's why Jude is there. It's to say what Peter foretold was going to happen is happening now. It's beginning to happen now. Wake up. Uh, they warned about the Antichrist. Um, let me just give you a little bit about the Antichrist just to make sure we, we cover it. 1 John chapter 2. What's the Antichrist? Uh, in the first place, the Antichrist is not... I mean, People do this. They say that the Antichrist is the same person as the beast in Revelation 13. Not true. They don't have anything to do with each other. The Antichrist is somebody else. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, John says, writing in the first century, it is the last hour. He's been reading the wrong books. <laughs> he thinks the last hour was then. Well, it was, folks. It was. It is the last hour, he says. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. Who are these many antichrists? See, there's not just one antichrist coming. There are many antichrists. And they're here now, John says, in the first century. This great apostasy. Who were these antichrists? He tells them in the very, very next verse. Former Christians. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that, that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. First uh, John chapter 4. Uh, verse 3. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. And in Second John... Verse 7 through 9, 
Many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things that we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So the Antichrist was this Gnostic teaching, this, this heresy that was pervading all the churches. People were getting revelations all the time. There were revelations and revelations and revelations. Um... I'll tell you a quick one. These guys would get these revelations and they would say, the Spirit told us real relevant stuff. The name of Noah's wife. Okay? Like, this is going to change your life, folks. The name of Noah's wife. Her name was Noria. <laughs> and then they got another revelation. Noah and Noria had a fight. And Noria wanted to go look in the ark. And Noah wouldn't let her. And they had a fight. And she says, I'm going in that ark. And he says, you are not. So she burned it down. So he built it back up. And just as she was getting ready to burn it down for the second or third time. From outer space come the archons. Okay. Sounds like Star Trek, right? The Archons landed. Um, <laughs> well, I... Uh, anyway, I, I'm skipping over part of this. But uh, uh, while the Archons are causing her trouble, and just as it looked like the Archons are going to destroy her, Elioth comes down. And Elioth lands. And she says, Who are you? And he says, Oh, I'm one of the four spirits that comes from the presence of God. And he tells us where the archons came from. Now, this is important. The archons, he said, this is how they came. First, there was God. And God had a daughter or an emanation from him, Sophia. Okay? And Sophia said, I want to have babies, but I want to have them all by myself, not with my husband. So she just sort of went off by herself and burped and had a baby. <laughs> and her child was heaven. And heaven burped and gave birth to shadow. Uh, and shadow burped and had a lion. And this lion was androgynous, okay? Meaning he was both male and female at the same time. And he went strutting around and said, You know who I am? I'm God. And Sophia had another daughter who came down, Zoe, and she said, You are not God. And he said, Oh, yes, I am. And she said, No, you're not, and I'll prove it. And she breathed on him and breathed fire on him. And the fire circled around him and tied him up and threw him in a big hole in the ground. And he looked up and he saw Zoe riding around in a chariot. This, I mean, people go to church and listen to this stuff, you know? Well, I got a revelation, you know? And he watched Zoe riding around a chariot, and he got real mad and real jealous and envious, and so he started burping like crazy. And he started burping out all these archons, okay? All these archons started coming out of him. Now, huh. <laughs> Ellie Leth said... Those archons are the ones who created earth and Adam and Eve, and they're the ones who told Noah to build the ark, and they're the real authors, those evil archons from that evil lion. They're the ones who really created flesh and blood. And Jesus, the, the, the Christ, is not one of those. And the, the Christ is spiritual. And the Christ doesn't have anything to do with the flesh. See? If you want to be really spiritual, you have to go through Christ. And of course, it's true that He's the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father but by Him, meaning that He's the first rung on the ladder. But you ascend through Him to all these other things, going all the way up to heaven. 
And you kind of get past the archons and move on all this spiritual stuff. And it was such a spiritual, spiritual, spiritual religion. It sounded real great. People would flock to churches to hear this kind of baloney. That's what was going on in the early church. The early church was plagued with heresy, riddled with it. And especially by the end of the age, God had to clean house on the church as well as Israel. Okay, the apostles warned of this coming apostasy, the coming of Antichrist, as well as a conflict that the Christians would have with the Roman Empire as a prelude to this coming hour of crisis when, God, when Jesus Christ would come in judgment against his covenant people, against the, the old covenant people. And so these, the Christians were warned in the New Testament to flee from the wrath that was about to come. What did Peter say on the day of Pentecost? Save yourselves from this perverse generation. This one. James chapter 5. Boy, I would love to just camp out on James chapter 5. But I won't. So I'll just pick up verses 7 through 9. Trouble is happening. There's this split taking place between Israel and the church. And persecution is happening. And Christians are really suffering. And James says in James 5, 7, Therefore be, pre be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. If you can just sort of hang on until 1989, I can give you 89 reasons. Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain, which has nothing to do with Azusa Street. But we won't get into that. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Okay? Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, unless you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Be patient until the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord is at hand. The judge is standing at the door. James says, watch out! Okay? I mean, it's like happening right now. Not, I mean, be patient until the coming of the Lord and we're still waiting. Now, it is true, lest I be misunderstood, let me say it tonight. I'll probably have to say it every night. I do believe the Bible teaches and historic Christianity has always insisted that there will be a coming of Christ in the future. I promise you there will be. The Apostles' Creed says so. The Nicene Creed says so. Not like their scripture or anything. But what I'm saying is Christians have always acknowledged this. Every major confession throughout church history of every group that's orthodox has always said there's going to be a second coming of Christ, or whatever they called it. They didn't always call it the second coming. But, uh, as the creed says, He shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead. He shall come. So I believe that. I teach it. But that's not the coming that James was speaking of there. James was speaking of a coming of Christ that was about to happen. It's the same coming of Christ that Christ warned the churches in Revelation 2 and 3 about. The same coming of Christ that Jesus warned the people about in Matthew chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 23 and Matthew chapter 24 and Luke 13 and so on and so on. Okay, There was a crisis that was about to happen in the first century. The message of Revelation is that the glory of God has come into the church. The kingdom has been taken from Israel and is now possessed by the new covenant people. Israel has become demon-possessed, full of pro false prophets, a very icon and image of pagan Rome. Jerusalem has become a harlot. She's been disinherited and is being excommunicated. And the covenant promises are inherited by faithful, prophetic, royal priests. Now this means that Revelation is not weird anymore. I've had people tell me again and again that they were scared of the book of Revelation to look too weird, too far out. But when we under, once we understand this, we can understand the book of Revelation just teaches what the Bible teaches. I mean, it's not some kind of weird appendix to the Bible that is real different from the rest of the Bible. It's just the Bible, okay? 
I mean, the Bible is the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God, but it's just the Bible. It's not like, you know, you open the door to Revelation and it gets real spooky on you. It's just the Bible. And it gives the same message that the Bible does. And that message is Jesus Christ. It can be understood. It can be understood. It's meant to be understood. Uh, John wrote to people in the first century. I mean, get this. The first century churches in Asia Minor that received the book of Revelation were expected. John said that some of you, at least, who have wisdom will be able to understand the number of the beast. Now, if, if it was possible for them to understand it, it couldn't possibly be Henry Kissinger. Okay? It couldn't possibly be Ronald six letters, Wilson six letters, Reagan six letters. Not possible. Now, you may want to say that Henry Kissinger or Ronald Reagan or the Pope or Hitler or whoever is a bad guy, and maybe you'll be right. Okay? I'm not going to talk politics with you right now. What I want to say is that the people in the first century that John was writing to were capable of understanding what 666 meant. They were capable of it. Which means it's not something that just popped up in the New York Times yesterday. It's something that they were in touch with then. Now, see, we take this approach with everything else. I mean, people say, wow, you, they even have a, a word for this, okay? The preterist approach to Revelation, okay? The preterist approach means that you think Revelation was written to the people in the first century and that meant something to them. That's the preterist approach. We have to figure out a word for it, okay? Hey, I got news for you, you know? Even Hal Lindsey, bless his heart, takes a preterist approach... To Galatians and Ephesians. I mean, you know, all those prophecy weirdos out there think, they actually think that when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, he was writing to first century believers in Corinth. Is that a weird interpretation or what? Okay. I mean, come on. We, what if somebody said, you know... 1 Corinthians wasn't really, really written for them. It was really written for, you know, okay? It had nothing to say. But see, what, one thing that people say is, wait a minute. If Revelation was prophesying events in the first century, that means it's not relevant for today. Well, what do you do with the other 65 books of the Bible? Okay? I mean, folks, who was Amos written for? It was written for, for Israelites, in the 8th century B.C. Well, I guess that's not relevant to me. Throw it out. Okay? 1 Corinthians isn't relevant to me. Throw it out. I mean, is that the way we treat the Bible? No, we read the Bible and we say, yeah, I know that James was written to other people. It wasn't written to me. But it's the Word of God, it's part of the canon of Holy Scripture that God has deposited in the church, and it's relevant for all time. I mean, we can make a distinction. See, when Jesus said to Peter and, and the, the other disciples, throw your nets on the right side of the boat, we don't think, oh, that's an eternal mandate that whenever I go fishing, i got to throw the net on the right side of the boat. It's biblical. Okay? No, we know he said that to them, not to us. Well, then that story must not be relevant for me. So just throw it out. No. But there's this tendency to think the only important person, really important person in the world is me. Have you ever, have you ever flown or, or just driving down a mountain or something, okay, at night, and you look out at all the lights in all those houses, thousands and thousands of houses, and realize that they're filled with people who have problems and wonderful events in their life and tragedies, and you'll never know them, at least in this life, and they'll never hear of you. They don't know or care about your problems. You have things that really matter to you, like it's the only thing in the world, and they don't know it. And they feel the same way about things in their life, and you don't care. 
I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's really an effort of will to realize there are other people in the world. It really is. And the trouble is, people go to the book of Revelation and they say, well, if it's not prophesying, you know, ballpoint pens, it's not relevant. Okay? Not true. Now, the, the thing that makes Revelation different, and I'll admit Revelation is different from the other books in the New Testament. The thing that makes Revelation different is what John says in the very first verse. Here we go with the first verse again. Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. The word signified is a technical word in the Greek. And uh, you can see in it, it works the same way in English as it does in Greek. See, if you just look at the first four letters of signified, it says sign. Okay? Works the same way in Greek. I mean, that's not an accident. He signified it. Okay? In other words, the book of Revelation says the same thing that the rest of the Bible says. In other words, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. But it's a revelation that is given in signs. That is a word that means signs. It means symbols. Symbolic language that's not just straightforward Book of Romans kind of stuff. Okay? It's signs. It's pictures. We can say things with pictures that we can't say other ways. And God communicates to us in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways he commu communicates to us is in word pictures. And he communicates things to us that you can't exactly say. You know, what if somebody came from Mars and saw you, we, we go through this strange ritual, you meet somebody and you grasp palms and move them up and down. What's that mean? Now, if you were put on the spot right now, and said, what does a handshake mean? Uh, well, uh, it means, hello, I'm your friend, I'm not carrying a weapon. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's touching, so that, you know, you feel good when somebody touches you, and you feel good when you touch somebody else. It's a way of making contact. It's, there are all kinds of things that that can mean. What does a kiss mean? Depends on who's kissing whom, doesn't it? Okay. <laughs> But I mean, what I'm saying, you know, maybe you're, um, now not everybody is like this. Um, uh, there are some people who, if they're upset, don't want to be touched, don't want to be hugged or anything. My wife and I are different, you know. If something is wrong, sometimes uh, my wife doesn't need me to sit down and give her a lecture on how all things work together for good, okay. Sometimes my wife just wants a hug. I don't have to talk. She'd rather I not talk. She just wants a hug. Okay? Now that hug is telling her things, telling her all kinds of things that we can't even verbalize. We can't put exactly into English words, but it's still communicating. Okay, the book of Revelation is like that. It gives us signs, gives us pictures. It's a prophetic language. Now that imagery, we need to understand, is in a system of symbolism. In other words, you can't just grab some symbol, some sign out of the book of Revelation and say, well, I think that means, you know, I look at locusts, looks like cobra helicopters to me. Okay? Or maybe killer bees. They are coming, you know. They're on their way north. Um, that is illegitimate. It's perverse to treat the Bible that way. To find out what the signs mean, we need to go to the Bible itself. And as I said before, Revelation has hundreds and hundreds of allusions to the Old Testament. Mark the Beast, as I said, goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. The harlot image in the Bible is a familiar image. And when we come across it in, in Revelation 17, we're not supposed to get shocked. Like, oh, what's this doing here? It's only all through the Bible, folks. But to understand it, you need to actually read the rest of the Bible. Pay attention to it. It is all about imminent events that were about to happen in the first century that people in the first century were expected to understand. 
The Re book of Revelation is all about the excommunication of Israel and the church's inheritance of the covenant. The book of Revelation is all about Christ's resurrection and ascension and rule from heaven over the universe. The book of Revelation is all about how God's people are restored to His image and seated with Christ in heavenly places. And the book of Revelation is all about this. Now this is something... This is crazy. Everybody misses this. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people... They go to the book of Revelation, and it's, it's the not seeing the forest for the trees problem. They look at all these things in the book of Revelation. Wow! Let's find out about it. And it can help if you just back off, okay? Just back away, stand back, take a look at it. And you know what happens when you do that? I mean, before we even decide all the stuff, okay? All this interesting things about what's going on, before we even make up our minds about that, the book of Revelation says something that's real, real significant. And let me give you a quick bird's eye view of that. And I'll quit. In Revelation chapter 4, and again I have to restrain myself, Revelation chapter 4, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. John gets raptured all the way up to the top of the cloud, where the throne is. By the way, this is a little digression, okay, but it's worth it. Um... The proof text. I mean, this is really scary when you think about it. The, the, I mean the, capital T, capital H, capital E proof text for the rapture is what I just read, Revelation 4.1. If, if you pin down a, a rapturist, okay, somebody who believes that the church is going to disappear and then there's going to be this seven-year tribulation and then the second coming, People who believe that, if you press them and say, where does the Bible teach it? We end up going to Revelation 4.1. John went up to heaven, so that must be a symbol. <gasps> I thought we, we were literalists here. A symbol of the whole church disappearing and going up to heaven. And so, for all the terrible things that happen in Revelation, the whole tribulation and all that stuff, all these things that get poured out, the church isn't there. And the way we prove that is that, lo and behold, until the second coming in the book of Revelation, if you buy that what they say is the second coming is the second coming, until that, the church isn't mentioned. Now, that bothers some people. They like, wow, that's a good point. I mean, you find church all over the place. Church is in chapter 1. And it says church in chapter 2. And it says church in chapter 3. And then the rapture happens in chapter 4, verse 1, and you don't hear about the church anymore. <gasps> Maybe they've got a point. Okay? Well, there are a couple problems with that. For one thing, it's not precisely true that the church disappears at the end of chapter 3 and comes back later at the end of the book. Because you know what? The word church never, ever occurs again. If that's true, then Revelation does not teach the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. It teaches the pre-tribulation annihilation of the church. Okay? It just flat disappears, folks. It's gone. If you're just looking at the word church. Another problem is that John never... Now, it's not that other people in the Bible don't do this. They do. But John never, for whatever reason, it would be interesting to talk about it sometime, John never uses the word church to mean the whole body of Christ. He never does. The only way John uses that term, and each, each writer of the Bible has his own terminology, okay? For whatever reason, John, when John uses the word church, he never means the whole body of Christ. He only means individual churches. So John would never say the church meaning everybody. So in that sense, he never uses the word church in Revelation. The only reason why the word church shows up in here at all 
is because in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, he's talking to these individual churches. But then he goes on with his message. Now, when he talks about the church as a whole, he uses other expressions like a multitude that no one can number or the bride of Christ. I mean, who do you think that is? Okay? There's another problem, and that's we get this kind of weird... I mean, do you realize that the word church does not occur in the book of Romans until chapter 15? No, in chap chapter 16. The word church is not in the book of Romans in the first 15 chapters. Therefore, the book of Romans is irrelevant for us because we're in the church, you know? Okay? The, book, the word love never occurs in the book of Ruth, so that's not a love story. You thought it was. The word God never occurs in the book of Esther. Okay? But God's all over the place there. I mean, heck, for that matter, sex isn't in the Song of Solomon. But... Okay. <laughs> um, okay, John... John goes up to heaven. He's up at God's throne and he sees what going on? He sees worship. They're worshiping up there. And John watches them worship and they're in the cloud. There are all these thunderings and lightnings and all that kind of stuff that we're supposed to know from reading the rest of the Bible or at least chapter 7 of Paradise Restored. <laughs> Little plug. <laughs> all this stuff in the cloud is going on and he's seeing worship taking place. And John sees something really significant. Uh, tell you what, I'll just pick it up in, in Revelation chapter 8. And uh, uh, verses uh, 3 through 5. That's not very long. Let me preface it by pointing out in Revelation 6, Verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Uh, so here are the saints in Revelation, the persecuted, martyred saints, praying, asking God for judgment. And he says, wait a little while. Uh, I can't resist. I'm going to tell you, I, we're, we're still in Revelation 8, but, I, but I've got to tell you what's in Matthew 21. Just one little thing, okay? Matthew 21, because this is so fun. I used to think, How do I do this? Okay, real fast. Okay, this is the fast version. Matthew 21, verse 1, when they drew near to Jerusalem, they came near to Bethphage, which means house of figs, at the Mount of Olives. Okay, so they came to the house of figs on the Mount of Olives. Okay, Jesus sent two disciples and said, go get a colt. Okay, he entered Jerusalem, right? He comes in. They're all singing down verse 9. Hosanna to the son of David. They're singing Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. He comes in, verse 11. The multitude said, This is Jesus, the, pro the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Nazareth means a branch. Okay? Then they leave. Verse 17. I told you we're moving fast. Verse 17. He left them and went out of the city to Bethany, which means house of dates. We got house of figs. We got house of olives. Okay, Mount of Olives. We have a branch and we have figs. Anybody getting hungry? Okay. Mmm. All this food. You getting hungry? I'm getting hungry. Jesus is getting hungry. Verse 18. And in the morning as he returned to the city, he was hungry. Okay. Is that great? <laughs> so... And verse 19, he saw a fig tree by the side of the road. He came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. He wants fruit. Remember I said Jesus had this ministry going through Israel looking for fruit and not finding any. He sees the fig tree. Oh, I'm hungry. All this talk about olives and figs and dates made me hungry. And he goes there and there's no fruit. There's just leaves. And he said, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. 
Now, the, the punchline of the story is later when Jesus says, the, he, he quotes Psalm 118 to them, because they, they say, what are you doing? And he says in verse 42, didn't you ever read in the scriptures? Oh, around uh, Psalm 118 or so. What's 118? The, this crowd had been singing to him. Hosanna! From Psalm 118, Jesus gets invited into Jerusalem. They're all waving palm branches, saying Hosanna and singing Psalm 118. Okay? Great! And Jesus said, hey, didn't you ever read in Psalm 118? The stone which the builders rejected, he, he quotes them a different part of the, the song. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The kingdom is going to be taken from you and given to a nation that produces what? Fruit. Okay? Now, here's Israel. Here's Jerusalem waving palm branches. And Jesus comes in this triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and he says, I'm hungry. Looks like maybe there's some fruit down there. And he comes down, and the temple is corrupt. And he throws the money changers out of the temple. There's no fruit, see? He came and he was hungry and he's looking for fruit. And all he gets is palm branches. All he gets is leaves. And that's what happened to the fig tree. Jesus looked for fruit and he came to the fig tree and all it was was leaves. That's what their profession of religion was. I mean, they made a big profession. Hosanna! Okay? And it was just leaves. And leaves are fine, but God wants fruit. And that's what, Psalm, what Matthew 21 is about. And like I said, sometime I'll come back and do the whole thing for you. But, okay, so now isn't that great, right? I mean, all this biblical theology I just gave you about the meaning of, of Matthew 21, this is great stuff. And when I first realized what Matthew 21 was really saying, I got so excited about it. And Jesus dropped the ball. Let's go back. Verse 18, in the morning as he returned to the city, he was hungry, seeing a fig tree by the, side, by the road. He came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And he said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. Now when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? And here is Jesus' chance. I mean, maybe he never read my book. You know, here's his chance to say, hey, disciples, let me give you a little biblical theology here. What I'm doing is symbolic. And here's the fig tree. And it had leaves but no fruit. And that's like the leaves I got when I made my entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. I got leaves but no fruit. See? Poof. Wither. It withers. Poof. Jerusalem withers. Right? And he didn't do it. You know what he does? All of a sudden he goes charismatic on him. I mean, what an opportunity... And he goes, Penty, here he is, verse 21. Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. All things, whatever you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. I mean, instead of telling him, it looks like all he's doing is, oh, mountain moving faith, you know? Folks, what mountain? you say to this mountain, the mountain, Mount Zion that the temple is on, say to that mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it'll be removed and cast into the sea. Go to Revelation 8, okay? Revelation 6, the martyrs are crying out to God. How long? Their blood is spilled around the altar. If Christian's blood has been spilled around the altar, who spilled it? The priests, they're the ones with the knives. Okay? So it's the priesthood of Israel that's been shedding the blood of Christians and it's poured out around the altar. And so they're crying out to God. Revelation 8, verse 3. Another angel having a golden censer, which is a little thing that you hold incense in, came and stood at the altar and he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. 
And then begin the seven, the seven angels with the seven trumpets to blow. The angel takes the incense, the prayers of God's people, offers it up to God. And then God says, okay, take that fire and throw it on the earth. And the angel takes the prayers of God's people and throws them on the earth. Boom! What happens? Verse 8. The second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. Okay? What were the Christians of the first century praying? Jesus pointed to the fig tree. He said, wither, and it did. It died. And Jesus said, you will be able to say to this mountain, be cast down and be thrown into the sea. And God's people in the first century prayed, Lord, destroy this mountain. Burn it down and throw it into the abyss so it's never heard from again. And that's what happened. That's what happened. In the Bible, do you remember when the two sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, offered strange fire? You know what that's about? When God accepted a sacrifice, the way God accepted sacrifices was this. Out of the cloud would come issuing this fire. The people, would, there's this great thing, I think it's Leviticus 9, the people offer a sacrifice, they put the sacrifice out there beside the tabernacle, and then they stand back and they wait. And fire shoots out from the, from the cloud and burns up the sacrifice, and all the people say, yay, why? Because if the, if the sacrifice wasn't accepted, if God didn't burn it up, that sacrifice was a substitute for them, Okay? Get the picture? So if God doesn't accept that sacrifice, huh, getting mighty hot, okay? They knew it was their neck. So when they see the sacrifice burned up with God's fire, all right, praise the Lord. God took that instead of us. Now, every sacrifice had to be lit with God's fire. So what God did was, with the priest was he gave them fire, and he said, you keep that fire going. Don't let it go out. And every holy fire that is lit has to be lit with this fire. Okay? Or else it's, it's strange fire. You can't just go light a match. And that's what Nadab and Abihu did. They just started their own fire. And it was strange fire. And God sent, you want some real fire, folks? Okay? End of Nadab and Abihu. All right. Every fire... Had to, now, the priest would carry around this fire, coals from the altar, that they, from the fire that they kept going. They would carry it around in censers. There was a rule in, in the Bible that if a city turned apostate totally against God, they were to take all the stuff from the city, all the loot and everything, everything, and move it into the central square, and the priest had to take fire, God's fire from God's altar and take that fire and throw it down and offer up that sacrifice as a burnt offering. But it would not be a burnt offering unless it was fire from the altar. He would take fire from the altar, coals from the altar, and put it, ignite that pile in the center of that apostate city and burn it down with fire from the altar. That's what's going on in Revelation 8. God takes the, the angel takes the prayers of God's people, offers them up to God, and they're acceptable to God, and then God says, okay, I'm going to apply those prayers. And he instructs his angel to throw it down at the city of Jerusalem. And the city of Jerusalem, an apostate city, ignites, it catches fire, the mountain burns up and is thrown into the sea. The message of the book of Revelation, beyond everything else, we can disagree on little non-essentials here and there. The message of Revelation, beyond everything else, is what is happening in history, is God's people are praying. And as the church worships and prays before God, if that worship is pleasing to God, if it's sending up a pleasing aroma to Him, He smells it and He says, that's what I want. And when it pleases Him, it has a direct effect on world events. World events are centered on the worship of Jesus Christ by the church. And as the church is worshiping Jesus Christ in the right way, things start exploding and mountains catch fire and fall into the sea. That's the power of our prayer. That's the power of corporate prayer. The church prays and worships together and things happen on earth. Okay? That's what Revelation... Revelation is a worship service. The whole book is a worship service that takes place in heaven. Why? Because we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
God shows you what worship is like in heaven so we can figure out how to do it on earth. And as we do it in the right way, God answers those prayers and history is changed. I better stop there. I'll turn it over to you.